Hello, I'm uh, Charlie Courtney. Uh, currently, I'm Associate Dean for Research and Graduate Studies at the College of Veterinary Medicine. However, before I became an administrative drone, I was a parasitologist, and I still teach parasitology to the veterinary medical students. I've been asked to give you an overview in one short hour of all of veterinary parasitology, which is quite a daunting task. Uh, so we will obviously have to make some compromises in what we cover, and we will get the job done. Now, the objectives of what I want to accomplish in such a short period of time are fairly simple. Uh, we want to prepare you for the questions most likely to be asked on the board exams. So we will emphasize the taxonomic hierarchy of the parasites, the, uh, their names, uh, the life cycles, and most of the emphasis will be on the helminths or the worm parasites. I will really emphasize life cycles as they apply to the major groups of parasites, the generalized life cycles, because that will help you understand what is going on in most cases. There are several major groups of parasites that uh, you need to be familiar with. Uh, the protozoa, of course, are the single cell parasites. The helminths are the worm parasites. And then finally, there are the arthropod parasites, the, the, the bugs, in other words. Uh, because of the fairly severe time limitations we have, you're going to have to do a lot of reading and review on your own. Uh, what I will do is cover in some detail the worm parasites, the helminths, and you will need to review the same sort of information as I have presented, on, review it on your own time for the protozoa and for the arthropod parasites. Now, for the protozoa, the particular groups you will want to pay attention to will be in the apicomplexa, the coccidia, at least briefly the malarial organisms, and the pyroplasms, that's Babesia and uh, their relatives, the ciliates, the amoebae, and the flagellates. With the arthropods, we're dealing with the two major groups, the insects and the acarina. Of the insects, the diptera, uh, the siphonaptera, or fleas, and lice will be the most important groups. Of the acarina, ticks and mites, and these will need to be reviewed. Now, what we will cover in some detail today will be the helminth parasites. The reason I have chosen to cover them is that they're very important to veterinary practice in the United States. Uh, livestock and pets are very commonly infected by the helminth parasites, and some of these organisms actually represent public health hazards, so it's very important that you're well aware of these. The major groups of helminths include the nematodes, and this is far and away the most important group, and these are colloquially known as roundworms. Then we have the cestones, also cestodes, also known as the tapeworms, the trematodes, also known as the flukes, and finally, a minor group, the acanthocephala, which are the thorny-headed worms. And this latter group I will not cover today. I would expect you to read about this group on their own. There are just a few minor parasites in this group, the most important one of which occurs in swine. Now, as I mentioned, the nematodes are far and away the most important group of helminths. Uh, anatomically, these follow what's called a tube within a tube body plan. These are long, thin, cylindrical worms, and they're unsegmented. Basically, they have a, a digestive system that runs from one end to the other, uh, making the tube within the tube. Uh, and uh, in between the digestive system and the body wall will be the reproductive system uh, and muscular system. These worms have a complete digestive system that is both a mouth and an anus. They have separate sexes, so we have male and female worms to deal with. And the males have tightness spicules, uh, hard objects that help during intromission. Uh, and this is uh, important because spicules are one of the few features of nematodes that are constant enough that they can be used for taxonomic identification at the species level. Nematodes are covered by a tough external cuticle, and they hold their shape by having a high a hydrostatic pressure internally. So they're under a fairly strong positive pressure much like blowing up a balloon. And that's why if you accidentally cut a living nematode, uh, the innards squirt out, to put it simply. Uh, it's also why males need a spicules, uh, something hard and rigid to force their way into the female during copulation. 
the tough external cuticle that keeps these worms in, sh in, uh, in, in their shape is often modified in various ways, ornamented. They may have a copulatory bursa, which is a hand-like appendage at the tail end of males. Uh, they may have other sorts of ornamentations or even the occasional spine or hook on them. And all of these are of taxonomic significance. The life cycle is pretty much the same in its most general form for all nematodes. Female nematodes produce eggs. In some cases, these eggs may hatch in the uterus of females, but nonetheless, these do produce initially eggs. Uh, once these eggs pass out, uh, there are four molts involving a total of five life stages of the uh, nematode. The egg produces the first stage, or L1 larva, which then molts to the L2, then L3, L4, and L5. The L5 is the sexually immature adult, and once the uh, male and female organs develop to maturity, we consider the L5 to be an adult. In most nematode species, the L3 is the infective stage for the final host. Earlier stages may infect intermediate hosts or transport hosts, depending upon the particular nematode species. There are a couple of exceptions. The asteroids are infected, are infectious at the L2 stage, although there is some disagreement among scientists as to whether or not this is truly an L2 or it actually molts to an L3 within the egg at the very last minute. And uh, uh, an oddball group, the tracheoroids, that include the whipworms and Trichinella spiralis, an important public health hazard in swine, these are infectious to the final host as an L1 and very distinctly a uh, deviation from our, our standard nematode pattern. There are a number of superfamilies of nematodes, and if you can learn the characteristics of these superfamilies, you will know a lot about a number of different species of nematodes. I've listed eight different superfamilies. We will not cover every one of these in detail. I will not deal with the spiroids or the oxyuroids, for example. And you can read on your own about these. Uh, we will, however, deal in considerable detail with most of the other superfamily, particularly the trichostrongoloids, the strongoloids, and the asteroids, as these are some of the most important nematode parasites that we encounter in veterinary medicine. The trichostrongoloids are probably our largest group. Uh, they infect a wide variety of animals, although as veterinarians, we're mainly concerned with this group as gut parasites of herbivorous animals. Uh, they live primarily in the stomach and in the small intestine, but there are the occasional exception. In general, the trichostrongoloids have a small spotty size. Uh, many of them are difficult to see with the naked eye. Uh, some of the larger ones are not more than a centimeter or so long. They have a very small mouth without any fancy ornamentations. Uh, characteristic of this group is the copulatory bursa in the male worm. The copulatory bursa is a hand-shaped appendage uh, that allows the male, on the tail of the male, and it allows the male to grasp the female worm during copulation. The uh, Copulatory bursa is supported by a series of finger-like rays, and the arrangement of these rays is of considerable taxonomic importance and helps us identify some of these worms to species. The male worms also have two spicules uh, that are used, again, in uh, copulation to help introduce sperm into the female worm. These spicules, which are made of chitin, are one of the few hard objects that are fairly constant in their size and are of uh, very, uh, very much of taxonomic importance and can help us make identifications of individual worms at the species level. Uh, another characteristic of the trichostrongoloids are that their life cycle in most cases, with very few exceptions, involves free living larval stages. That is, the eggs hatch out in the environment. Larvae usually feed on bacteria, typically in the feces, uh, and develop to the third larval stage. Uh, and, and then and only then are they infectious for their final host. And that makes these larvae fairly uh, susceptible to vagaries of climates. Because they have an egg that is expected to hatch rather quickly in the environment, most trichostrongoloids uh, shed an undeveloped, thin-shelled uh, egg. This is passed in the feces. Oxygen uh, and water can diffuse through this thin egg shell. And under most conditions, this egg will rapidly develop. 
and hatch. Under ideal conditions, these, egg, these eggs will hatch in less than a day's time. Uh, typically, they hatch in the feces. The L1 larvae is a bacterial feeder, which uh, really shows some of the relationships of this particular group of parasites to free-living nematodes that also feed, or live in the soil and also feed on bacteria. Uh, the L1 will develop to the L2, which is also a bacterial feeding stage, and then finally molts to the third larval stage, uh, the infectious stage. Now, the L3, in contrast to the L1 and L2, typically does not feed, and in fact, in most cases, it retains the second stage cuticle uh, as a sheath. Imagine it as something like a spacesuit. Uh, water can pass across the cuticle, but not much else. This is more or less a resting stage, and in most trichostromaloids, this will crawl up on grass and remain dormant while waiting for the final host to eat it, uh, and, and, and does not feed anymore. These free-living stages are quite susceptible to extremes of climate. Too hot, too cold, or too dry are all conditions that can be lethal. So in the environment, typically pastures, in most climates, there are times of the year in which the environment uh, is such that infection disappears from pasture, and these worms survive this adverse season of the year inside their final host, which makes it very possible for us to use strategically timed antimetic treatments, treat the final host at times of the year when a few larvae are alive on pasture, and manage to kill most of the worms on the property. And the strategic treatment schemes used to control these parasites are based on this principle. Most trichostrongaloids are diagnosed by finding the typical strongyl type egg in the feces of the host. Now here's a picture of some eggs. In this case, it's from a sheep. This thin-walled egg with a little multicelled embryo inside is uh, very typical of strongyls, the so-called strongyl type egg. Uh, it doesn't matter whether it's a trichostrongyl or a second group we call the strongyls. This could be hookworms in dogs and cats. It could be a trichostrongyloid hemophis in sheep. It could be another trichostrongyloid uh, ostracasia in cattle. It could be the larger, small strongyls of horses. There are a very large number of worms that shed eggs that have this appearance. So if you learn this type of egg, you're familiar with what it looks like, and aware of the different species in the different hosts that shed this type of egg, you will have most of your diagnosis correct. Now, there's one exception uh, to some of our trichostromaloids, and that's this very large egg here. Clearly, there's something different about this, although this is indeed a trichostromaloid egg. This is nematodirus, uh, an intestinal trichostromaloid of ruminants. There are several species involved. Its life cycle is somewhat different. In the case of nematodirus, the larva develops inside this very large egg. There's sufficient food in there for this larva to develop all the way to the L3 stage. It remains somewhat dormant in this egg until conditions are right. Then the egg will hatch. The larvae will uh, just explode in the environment in very large numbers, and in transmission to the final host quickly occurs. Uh, this is a unique modification just to that species. This is a whipworm egg, a different group, a tricheroid. We'll talk about it later in our lecture. But while I have it here, the key to the whipworms are these plugs in either end. As I mentioned, the Infectious stage is usually the third larval stage, and for most trichostrongaloids, these larvae will ascend herbage, typically with the mo morning dew, and are then eaten by grazing animals. And this is a somewhat artistically enhanced example of a dew drop with larvae in it. And give you an idea of how infectious uh, pastures can become, particularly when you're grazing small ruminants in the summertime in Florida. These pastures can become remarkably infected. So it's a very efficient life cycle. The third larval stage is now swallowed by the grazing host. And once this happens, there are really no fancy migrations, uh, such as occur with many of our other nematode parasites. They develop at or very close to their final site in the hole in the host. Often they'll develop right in the lumen of the or in the wall of the organ in which they dwell uh, in the lumen as adult worms. For most trichostrongaloids, there's a prepatent period of approximately three weeks. The prepatent period is the time from which a larva is swallowed until that larva has matured into an egg-laying adult worm. Now let's look at a few trichostrongaloids, and again, with each of these, you may want to read in most detail.
in a small room, and it's far and away the most important trichostrongoloid in most climates, belongs to the genus Haemolcus. Haemolcus lives in the abomasin of ruminants, and Haemolcus contortus is the important one. Uh, it is a deadly bloodsucker, very voracious bloodsucker. It can accumulate in the abomasin of small ruminants in large numbers. Uh, and in Florida, it's one of the main reasons that sheep and goat production in this state is fairly minimal. Um, Haemolcus has a very high biotic potential. The females are quite fecund during warm weather. This life cycle can run very rapidly, and large numbers of worms can build up. As a result of having so much genetic horsepower, these worms have developed resistance to most of the commonly used antihelmintics. And indeed, on some sheep and goat farms in the state, we have populations of worms that are resistant to every known antihelmintic, and some operations have had to cease because they cannot keep Haemolcus out of sheep and goats. And in small ruminants, this worm is a killer. It is not unusual to see sheep and goats dying uh, from this parasite. They will be characterized by a profound anemia, hypoproteinemia characterized by submandibular edema. In cattle, as a second species of Haemolcus, Haemolcus plasii, it can be an important uh, parasite of cattle, particularly younger cattle in warm climates, but is nowhere near as important in cattle as Haemolcus contortus is in small ruminants. The genus Ostertasia is another abomasal parasite of ruminants. Of these, Ostertasia ostertagi in cattle is the most significant. And in fact, in most temperate climates, this is the most important nematode parasite of cattle. However, it does not tolerate warm climates and is effectively absent from the tropics. Uh, unlike Haemolcus, which causes disease by sucking blood, Ostertasia develops in the glands of the abomasin, the glands that produce hydrochloric acid, pepsinogen, uh, and mucus, and it disrupts the architecture of these glands, basically causing the abomasin to cease to function, and this in turn results in a protein-losing diarrhea. Trichostrongolus is a third abomasal parasite, although there are several species within this genus, and some will occur in the small intestine as well. Uh, Trichostrongolus infects a variety of animals. Uh, different species may even be found in rodents, uh, but the ones we'll talk about are primarily stomach and intestinal parasites of herbivores. Trichostrongolus axii is relatively cosmopolitan, occurs in the abomasum of ruminants and in the stomach of horses, although there is some controversy as, whether, as to whether or not Trichostrongolus axii in horses uh, is, in, is perhaps a separate strain uh, from that infecting cattle and may be well on its way to becoming a separate species. This parasite is, uh, I consider it somewhat pathogenic. It would be very unusual to see disease caused by Trichostrongolus axii alone. Usually it contributes to disease caused by Haemolcus contortus in small ruminants or Ostertasia ostertagi uh, in, in cattle. Uh, Trichostrongolus caluberformis is an intestinal uh, parasite. Uh, this one occurs in ruminants, particularly in small ruminants. Uh, like Trichostrongolus axii, it is somewhat pathogenic and contributes to disease, but may not be necessarily uh, a major cause of disease all by itself. A third uh, Trichostrongoloid is probably important because of what it doesn't do. This is the genus Cuperia, of which there are quite a number of species. Uh, the, this parasite infects the small intestine of ruminants, and often this is the most abundant parasite in ruminants, particularly in cattle, where numbers may be anywhere from 30 to 100,000. They can shed a large number of eggs in the feces of these animals uh, as a result of their abundance, Yet, on a worm-for-worm -worm basis, these parasites are not very pathogenic. Uh, in fact, it is difficult to demonstrate any economic response when treating infections that consist solely of cuperia, but they are very abundant uh, and should be taken into consideration. So that pretty much covers the trichostrongoloids, as I mentioned, primarily parasites of ruminants, occasionally in some other species, but within ruminants, these make up some of the very most important parasites. Now, a closely related group of uh, parasites are the uh, strongoloidea. Uh, 
Uh, very similar to the striker, trichostrongaloids, typically a little bit larger. But like the trichostrongaloids, they're mainly gut parasites, although they live primarily in the small and large intestine rather than in the stomach and the small intestine, uh, as the trichostrongaloids do. These are somewhat intermediate in size. Most of them can be seen uh, fairly easily with the naked eye. These are not by any means giant worms, such as an ascarid, but they will be one or two centimeters long, fairly robust, and easily seen if you know what to look for. Uh, they have a more robust mouth than the trichostrongaloids, typically with a pronounced buccal capsule and often some ornamentation around the mouth, most often something called a corona radiata or a feather-like crown completely encircling the mouth. Uh, like the um, trichostrongaloids, male strongaloids have a copulatory bursa. Uh, they also have two spicules, but they typically have a gubernaculum, a third tightness body that spicules more or less rub against as they exit the male worm. Uh, and like the trichostrongaloids, they have free living larval stages and a very similar life cycle in most respects. Um, but the major difference between the trichostrongaloids and the strongaloids in their life cycle is that once an L3 infects the host, often the L3 undertakes a variety of migrations, some of which can be quite extensive, uh, before they finally settle in their predilection site uh, within the host. And as a result, most strongaloids have a much longer prepatent period uh, than we would see with trichostrongaloids. Uh, typically, oh, four to eight weeks, and with some of the more extreme cases, the, the life cycle, the prepatent period may uh, be close to a year. There are several groups of strongaloids, uh, that, that, and again, these groups can infect more than one uh, species of host. Probably one of the more widely distributed groups are the hookworms. The hookworms are blood-sucking uh, strongaloid nematodes. Uh, they infect the small intestine of many species of animals, uh, including carnivores, herbivores. Uh, there are even some distant relatives in birds. Of the hookworms, the genus Ancelostoma is far and away the most important, and this includes hookworms of dogs and cats. Now, the life cycle has uh, been expanded a bit with these hookworms because the route of infection, once the uh, L3 stage is attained, uh, can vary. Uh, Many of the species of Ancelostoma can simply penetrate the skin. They do not have to depend upon the host swallowing them. And this is particularly important since this hookworm is adapted to carnivores, which are much less likely to be eating grass and therefore much less likely to ingest larvae from the environment. They can, however, swallow larvae and complete the infection that way. And in addition, uh, Ancelostoma, and particularly Ancelostoma caninum in the dog, may be passed from the uh, mother to the offspring in the colostrum. And in the case of the dog, uh, it is possible for a fatal infection to be passed in the colostrum. Finally, members of this genus may accidentally penetrate the skin of humans. Now, a human uh, is an abnormal host for the species of Ancelostoma that we deal with in veterinary medicine. And once this worm has penetrated uh, the skin of a human, it more or less gets lost it can't get below the uh, epidermis, and basically it migrates right ar in, around in the surface of the skin, leaving a red, tortuous tract behind that is quite pruritic. Uh, and it can be easily treated. Another genus of strongaloid is esophagostomum. These are known as nodular worms uh, and are primarily uh, in swine and ruminants. The reason we call them nodular worms is due to a quirk in their life cycle. The life cycle is, for the most part, like that of trichostrongaloids, except that after the larva is swallowed, the larva will develop in the wall, or uh, the third stage larva will develop through the fourth stage in the wall, of the small intestine, and large intestine. Uh, and what's different about these worms is the host may react violently to the presence of these larvae. First of all, you get hemorrhage at the infection site in the wall of the small intestine, uh, and then the larva may be killed, and uh, there is a reaction that leads to caseation, necrosis, and nodule formation. And you end up with a nodule that, in extreme cases, can be most of a centimeter across, certainly a half a centimeter across, uh, and uh, filled with caseous exudate. 
and large numbers of these nodules in the wall of the intestine will clearly disrupt the function of the intestine and can cause diarrhea and weight loss. Another group of strongyloids are a group that are commonly called the strongyles in horses. These are parasites primarily in the cecum and colon of horses and their relatives, donkeys and zebras. They have a direct life cycle, and uh, once in the final host, they, what happens next really depends on which of the two major groups of strongyles the worms belong to. First of all, the large strongyles. In the past, the large strongyles have been far and away the most important parasite of horses. Uh, there are three species in this genus, uh, particularly Strongylus vulgaris uh, un uh, undergoes a fairly extensive tissue migration. Actually, all of them undergo an extensive tissue migration, but one of them, Strongylus vulgaris, the tissue migration involves a period of residence in the cranial mesenteric artery, uh, which is the major artery feeding the gut of horses. Uh, and as a result, uh, this is a fairly pathogenic species. The larva of Strongylus vulgaris uh, can occlude that, art uh, that artery, uh, compromising the blood supply to the gut uh, and leading to serious colics. In addition, the adult worms are blood suckers, and if large populations accumulate, the horse can suffer anemia and ill thrift. These were once the most important uh, parasites of horses and caused a great deal of difficulty However, when the antimonic ivermectin appeared on the market in the 1980s, these parasites all but disappeared. It turns out that this group is exquisitely susceptible in all life cycle stages to ivermectin. So a single dose of ivermectin at 200 micrograms per kilogram body weight kills all large strongyles in the animal. And given the very, very long pre-patent period, six months for Strongylus vulgaris and up to 11 months for some of the other species, uh, if you're treating a horse more than once a year, you effectively eradicate them. And in fact, this parasite has been eradicated on many properties. Now, in contrast to the large strongyles, or the small strongyles, are more correctly termed the cyapostomes. Uh, this is a very large group of closely related strongyloid nematodes of horses. There are more than 40 species. There's some argument about the actual numbers of species and which ones are valid. But uh, suffice it to say, there are many different species. Most horses will be infected any, with anywhere from five to ten of these species at a minimum. Uh, these tend to be very uh, abundant worms. Infections in horses may exceed uh, 10,000 adult worms and sometimes up to 100,000 adult worms. Unlike the large strongyles, the small strongyles do not undergo extensive migrations in the body of the horse. Uh, Instead, uh, they develop in the wall of the cecum and colon, pretty much uh, right where they will uh, emerge and live as adult worms. So you have a relatively short pre-patent period of some 8 to 12 weeks. However, as these worms grow in the wall of the cecum and colon, they cause some damage to the wall and interfere with its absorptive function and mainly causes ill threat. Horses that weigh 50 pounds less than they should in some extreme cases, you may get bouts of recurring colic and diarrhea, but that is far and away the exception rather than the rule. For many years, small strongyles were thought to be harmless, uh, and it wasn't really until we were able to control large strongyles reasonably well that we discovered that small strongyles, in fact, uh, also cause problems. And now, uh, with the eradication of large strongyles on many properties, small strongyles have become our most important parasites of horses. And one of the reasons they're now our most important parasite is this last item on the slide. Small strongyles have developed resistance to many of our antimentics. And in fact, the macrocyclic lactones, that is ivermectin and moxidectin, are the only antimentics that we find can still work reliably on all horse farms in Florida. Most horse farms have worms resistant to the benzimidazoles, and we seem to be losing pyrantel salts. About half the farms now have worms that are resistant to pyrantel salts. And it's making it very difficult to control small strongyles. Okay, so much for the strongyles. Between the trichostrongyles and the strongyles, we really have covered uh, the majority of the very important parasites, particularly of herbivorous animals. And it's important that you... Uh,
get a textbook and review this material in some detail. Before I go on to the asterids, which is the other really important group of nematode parasites, I want to cover one oddball group, uh, the rhabditoids. Uh, these are very distantly related to the strongylo uh, strongyloids and the trichostrongyloids, and to make matters worse, the name of the most important genus, strongyloides, becomes quite confusing. Uh, and our students have no end of trouble keeping this parasite straight. Strongyloides is not a strongyl, it is not a trichostrongyl, it is a rhabditoid, and whoever gave it its name ought to be shot because it's confused many generations of students. This is a very unusual group of parasites and probably reflect the evolution that has already occurred with the trichostrongyls and the strongyls, in that this appears to be a group that is making the transition from a free-living existence to a parasitic existence. Adult male and female strongyloides live in the environment as free-living, soil-dwelling nematodes that feed on bacteria in the environment. They reproduce sexually in the environment. Uh, they lay eggs that hatch out and produce larvae. Uh, so these are basically free-living nematodes, like many, many species of other non-parasitic uh, soil-dwelling nematodes. However, it turns out that some of these L3 larvae can infect certain hosts. There are species that infect ruminants, there are species that infect horses, there are species that infect dogs, cats, people, you name it. Uh, however, when these larvae mature in the final host, they do not produce male and female worms. These larvae only are female. So you end up with an infection in the small intestine of the final host consisting only of females who then lay eggs without having mated with male worms, a condition known as parthenogenesis. Uh, you tend to have very small worms in very large numbers. They can produce large numbers of eggs. And in many hosts, these worms will cause diarrhea and weight loss. Typically, in ruminants, uh, there's a quick uh, acquired immunity, so you may have disease in calves and lambs and goat kids, but not in adults. In horses, we seem to see no disease whatsoever. In contrast, with dogs and cats, there is not a very strong acquired immunity and we may see chronic diarrheas in adult animals. Infection is by the larva either penetrating the skin or by swallowing the third stage larva. Diagnosis is typically by finding larvated eggs or larvae in the feces of the final host, and whether you find eggs or larvae depends a little bit on the species of the final host. Typically eggs in larvated eggs in ruminants and larvae in dogs. Uh, a number of species, Strongyloides ransomi is a parasite in young pigs, and in the southern United States, this is a parasite of major importance in our swine industry. Uh, and if you're raising pigs in the southeast, you must take steps to control this parasite. Strongyloides papillosis is a parasite of young ruminants. Under most circumstances, it's not a parasite we have to be concerned with. However, if young lambs or goat kids are kept in muddy conditions, uh, in the summertime here in Florida, you may actually see some clinical disease. Strongyloides westeri is a parasite of uh, foals. Uh, typically does not cause disease. You'll see a very large number of eggs shed in the feces of the foals. Uh, the number of eggs is such that you get very concerned about disease, uh, but this does not appear to really be a problem. In contrast, Strongyloides stercoralis, which is a parasite of dogs and humans, can cause chronic and protracted diarrhea in dogs, as can strongyloides tumefaciens in cats, and these two will infect the adult animals and can be somewhat difficult to get rid of. So much for strongyloides, the trichostrongyles, and the strongyles. You can review your notes with these parasites, uh, make sure you know what major groups they belong to, pay attention to the life cycles, and review some of the diagnostic stages. Most textbooks will have that information. A fourth group of worms and another group of nematodes that are clinically very important in a variety of species are the ascaroids. The ascaroids are typically our largest nematode parasites in veterinary medicine, and these worms can become quite large, um, you know, often uh, in, in the vicinity of 20 or more centimeters. Uh, they become uh, almost a centimeter in diameter, so they're easily seen with the naked eye. And in fact, they look like nothing uh, so much as a very large earthworm. Uh, 
Asteroids typically inhabit the small intestine of the final host. And in most cases, there's a very good acquired immunity to asteroids, so we tend to think of asteroids as causing disease in young animals only, not typically in adults, although there may be a few exceptions. One of the key physical characteristics of the asteroids uh, are, uh, are the mouth. The mouth is characterized by three very conspicuous lips, and I will refer you to any textbook to see what those look like. And that's a dead giveaway that given a very large, robust worm, you're dealing with an asteroid. Most asteroids have a very simple and direct life cycle, uh, although species infecting carnivores may use some transport or intermediate host, and in fact, some of these species constitute an important zoonosis. In most cases, there's a liver and lung migration following infection. Uh, again, something that is very characteristic of the asteroids, although a few species have given this up. Now, in herbivores and omnivores, we don't have any transport or intermediate hosts, so we have a very simple direct life cycle where an egg is shed in the feces. Uh, this egg is quite tough and can live for years in the environment. It's ingested by a final host. It migrates from the intestine uh, through the portal system to the liver and then eventually uh, through the venous system to the lungs uh, where it breaks out into the bronchial passages, coughed up, swallowed, and the next trip through the small intestine, it sets up housekeeping as an adult worm. Uh, typically, Aspirosuum, which is the most important nematode parasite of swine, and Parasperus equorum, which is a very important nematode parasite of foals and a parasite that you must take into consideration uh, whenever you're setting up a, a worm control program for a breeding operation. Uh, there are, however, parasites in carnivores, asteroids in carnivores, that may use transport or intermediate hosts. The most important of these is Toxicara canis. Uh, this one has quite a variable life cycle. Uh, beginning with the egg out in the environment that, like all typical asteroids, is quite resistant to environmental extremes and can survive for years. This egg may be swallowed directly by a puppy, uh, and in that relatively non-immune animal, it will quickly develop to an adult worm in the gut of the animal after a liver-lung migration. However, if this uh, egg is swallowed by uh, an adult dog, particularly a bitch that is somewhat immune, this worm will not complete a liver-lung migration. Instead, it will accumulate in the body tissues, primarily uh, in, in the uterus and the mammary glands, such that when the bitch becomes pregnant, uh, just before parturition, uh, starting about 42 days or so of gestation, a large number of these larvae will migrate across the placenta and infect the pups. And in fact, the pups are born with the asteroids in their liver, plus some of these larvae are also transmitted in the colostrum to the pups. So you have a very efficient prenatal transmission. And then finally, if eaten by an animal other than a dog, typically a small rodent, but occasionally a person, uh, these third stage of these larvae will hatch, um, go to the third stage, and then just remain dormant in that host, waiting to, for that host to be eaten by a dog. Now, in the case of humans, these larvae may get lost and start to migrate around, uh, where they don't cause a lot of trouble unless they happen to get into the retina of the eye. Uh, and there are a number of pediatric cases of retinitis caused by Toxicara canis larvae and less commonly Toxicara cati larvae migrating in the retina of the eye of children. And for this reason, it is absolutely imperative that we totally suppress all uh, aspirin egg output in puppies during their first several uh, months of life. Uh, I can refer you to the website at the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta uh, to find recommendations on how to prevent this. Toxicara cati in cats has a very similar life cycle, except it does not use placental transmission. Like Toxicara canis, um, it is zoonotic. There appears to be less acquired immunity to Toxicara cati in that adult cats can be infected. And then finally, Toxaspirus leonina, it infects both dogs and cats. It tends to favor colder climates than Florida, although it's seen here on occasion. It does not do the liver-lung migration, and as it develops instead, straight away in the gut to the adult worms. Uh, and by doing so, it escapes much of host immunity. So we find that this parasite can occur in older animals, 
And if any of you are working in zoos, this one can become very problematic in your big cats. Asteroids cause disease in the final host primarily by competing with that host for nutrients that are in the in small intestine. So basically, asteroids have been described as starving the host to death from the inside. Uh, on rare occasions, asteroids may cause more spectacular form of disease by obstructing the gut or perhaps causing an intestinal intersusception where the gut telescopes in on itself. Obstruction of the gut is particularly problematic and, and, and is a considerable risk when treating very heavily infected animals, notably puppies and particularly foals. If you're presented with one of these animals with a very, very heavy aspirin infection, you may want to treat first with an animal medic that is only partly effective to kill part of the aspirin population and come back a week later and get the risk, get the rest. Otherwise, the risk of causing an obstruction by or an impaction by a mass of dead worms is, is considerable. Asteroids are easily diagnosed because they shed very large numbers of characteristic eggs. These are very thick-walled eggs. Um, their appearance varies with species. You can look them up in any textbook. Uh, these eggs can survive a long time in the environment. The vast majority of them will easily survive a year, and in small numbers they may survive more than five years. So uh, infection, once it occurs in the environment, can be very persistent. Another group of nematodes are the filaroids. There are quite a number of species of these, but one is of particular importance to us in small animal medicine. The filaroids are usually a very long worm. They tend to be rather slender, and without exception are transmitted by an arthropod intermediate host. And as adults, they typically inhabit the blood or lymphatic system of their final host, a few of them may dwell in tissues, uh, and some species may dwell in body cavities. Uh, the female worms do not lay eggs. Instead, they produce microfilaria, which can best be described as motile larvated eggs. These are not L1 larvae. They go to L1 larvae once they've been ingested by the intermediate host. And they're ingested by a blood-sucking uh, or tissue fluid feeding intermediate host uh, typically, and in most cases, a mosquito, although it can be a black fly or culicoides. Uh, of these, the most important, far and away, is Dirofilaria imitis, the dog heartworm. Uh, clearly, uh, I could spend hours lecturing on this parasite alone, so I just need you to be aware of the name. It uses a mosquito as its intermediate host. Uh, clearly causes severe pulmonary disease when you have worms that are uh, 20 centimeters or more living in the heart and pulmonary arteries. And here in Florida, a typical infection uh, may be 20 to 30 of these adult worms. It's, it's amazing the dog can even live with this number of worms in them. Uh, diagnosis is made by finding microfilaria in the blood, uh, either by a wet mallet, a drop of blood, or more preferably by lysing a milliliter of blood and then examining a sediment of the lysate for the presence of microfilaria can be done either by centrifugation or membrane filtration. And more recently, we've discovered that these worms secrete large quantities of antigen into the uh, bloodstream of the dog, and there are many commercial tests out there that detect antigens of dinosauria imitis, and these are the, this is the preferred method of diagnosis at this time. As I said, I have uh, much too much to say about the dog heartworm, uh, and I recommend that you see the website of the American Heartworm Society to learn more about this parasite. There is one other filarial nematode in dogs that you should be aware of, and that's Dipetalonema reconditum, which is sometimes called a false heartworm. Uh, this is a much smaller worm, only a few inches long, um, lives in the subcutaneous tissues of dogs. It is transmitted by fleas, and the primary importance of this parasite is that it's harmless, but it produces microfilaria in the blood that unless you take the time to critically examine any microfilaria you find in the blood of the dog, you could conceivably mistake uh, microfilaria of this harmless parasite uh, which, for which no treatment is needed. Uh, you could mistake the microfilaria for that of the dog heartworm, which is something you won't treat very aggressively. There are several other cetaria that we might find in li or filaria that we might find in livestock. The genus Cetaria lives in the body cavity. There are species that occur in cattle and horses, and are generally harmless, 
On rare occasion, larvae of this parasite may enter the central nervous system, getting lost in their uh, migration through the animal's body, and uh, cause acute CNS disease. But those are very rare uh, phenomena. And for the most part, the adult worm in its predilection site, that is the body cavity, is considered harmless. Also, we have several species of Oncocerca that infect typically ligaments in horses and cattle. Uh, although there's been much discussion in the past, it now appears that these parasites are relatively innocuous and are not anything to be concerned about. The final group of nematodes I'll talk about are the tricheroids. Uh, the tricheroids are uh, somewhat different from the other nematodes we've discussed. Uh, taxonomically, they uh, in, represent a whole other line of nematodes, and if you're interested in that, you can uh, read about the difference between phasmid and aphasmid nematodes. Uh, just suffice it to say that they're, they're not quite the same uh, creatures as our other nematodes. Morphologically, they're characterized by a long, thin anterior end containing what we call a beaded esophagus. A beaded esophagus is an esophagus consisting of a single column of cells uh, with a basically a capillary tube running down the middle of that column of cells, uh, very easily visible under the microscope. The male worms have but a single spicule, and unlike uh, our other nematodes, the L1 stage is the stage that's infected to the final host. And remember I said before it was typically the L3, uh, possibly the L2 in asteroids, although there's some that argue that at the very last instant the L2 molts the L3 as the egg is hatching. Uh, two major groups of worms within the tricheroidea. The first one, uh, Trichinella spiralis. This is a major public health hazard because humans can be infected. It's known as the trichina worm and we are primarily concerned with it in swine. The life cycle is rather interesting because we have both adults and larvae. Uh, the same animal is both the final host and an intermediate host. An animal is infected by eating infected uh, striated muscle tissue. Uh, the uh, L1 insisted in, in the infected muscle tissue is developed in the intestine of the final host uh, into adult worms which mate and then the females uh, shed L1 larvae in very large numbers. These larvae enter the circulation, are carried out to the muscles where they insist in the muscles. So that's in the same host in which you had the adult worms. So each animal is both a final host first and then an intermediate host second. And the life cycle is completed. Uh, if another animal kills that animal or scavenges the carcass of that animal and eats its muscles. So transmission is by carnivorism. Um, during the muscle infection stage, uh, a fair amount of damage is done. The animal can get quite ill, suffer considerable muscle pain. Uh, and this is the stage that can infect humans and even cause, disease, uh, cause death in humans. And this is why we're concerned about this parasite in swine. Uh, it is endemic to swine in the United States. It's an important zoonosis uh, and it's something that you will need to read more about. And I will refer you to the website um, at the uh, Centers for Disease Control to learn more about this parasite. Genus Triceros are known as the whip worms, and they're so named because the shape of the worm is that of a whip. Uh, you have a short, fat posterior end containing the intestine and containing the reproductive organs, and then a very long, thin anterior end, and this is quite a long anterior end containing simply the esophagus. And it looks nothing uh, like nothing so much as a short-handled, long bullwhip, uh, hence the name. These have a very direct life cycle. They shed that egg with the double polar plugs that I demonstrated earlier in this lecture. Uh, the egg is quite resistant. Lives for years in the environment. Transmission occurs when the egg is swallowed, uh, and the uh, larva develop just directly in the cecum. Uh, to the adult worms. And these worms prefer to live in the cecum or in the colon very near to the cecum. They cause disease by sucking blood uh, and their little uh, anterior ends, those long thin anterior ends, burrow into the mucosa of the cecum where they may carry some bacterial infection. So the net result is you end up with a hemorrhagic large bowel diarrhea uh, with anemia and weight loss. Diagnosis is made by uh, finding the characteristic eggs on fecal flotation. Several species of trichuris to deal with. 
Cyclurus vulpus is the whiff-arms of dogs. It's quite pathogenic, and you will deal with it often in small animal practice. Cyclurus campanula is the whiff-arm of cats, and this is somewhat unusual, uh, since many of you will be practicing in southeastern Florida. This is one you need to be aware of, because it's a tropical parasite, uh, and uh, about the only place it occurs in the continental U.S. is in southeastern Florida. We do not know much about the pathogenicity of this parasite. Trichurisuis is the whip on the swine. It is a very important parasite of swine, and your control program for parasites in swine must take this organism into account. Trichurus discolor and Trichurus ovus are parasites found in ruminants, uh, as near as we can tell, at least in cattle, sheep, and goats, whipworms are harmless. If any of you are doing zoo work, you may find that whipworms can cause clinical disease in camels uh, and some of their relatives. So that's the exception to whipworms being harmless in ruminants. With that, I've covered the, lem ne the nematodes, which are far and away our most important helmet parasites. I will briefly touch on the trematodes, or flukes, uh, and the cestodes, or tapeworms. Uh, both of these are flatworms, belong to the phylum platyhelminthes. These are typically animals that do not have a body cavity uh, and tend to be very flattened. Uh, in both cases, these worms, at least the ones imported in veterinary medicine, are usually visible with the naked eye and are not that difficult to see at necropsy. Uh, these are flattened worms, as I said, having no body cavity. In the case of the trematodes or the flukes, we have a digestive system. But this is called a blind digestive system because it has only one opening, a mouth that serves both for intake of food and expulsion of excreta. The flukes also have one or more muscular suckers, one of which surrounds the mouth. And the trematodes, like the cestodes, uh, are hermaphroditic. That is, both sets of sexual organs occur within the same animal. The adult trematodes are typically parasites of vertebrates, and um, almost every one of them, without exception, requires a snail as a first intermediate host. And depending on the species of the trematode, they may use other intermediate hosts in their life cycle. Um, the life cycle typically involves a number of stages. Uh, first of all, you have an egg shed in the feces, and the eggs of flutes typically have a little cap on the top of them, an operculum, a weak spot in the end of the egg shell that can pop open uh, once that egg is developed and conditions are right for hatching. When the egg hatches, a ciliated larva called a myrcidium swims out, and this larva seeks a snail. Uh, typically, the, uh, the snail that these parasites will infect is highly specific. Each species will infect only a very limited number of snail species, usually closely related snail species, and the Myricidia have the ability to chemically sense the presence of these snails and more or less swim down a chemical trail in the water to find the snail. After a variable period of development in the snail through several stages, uh, you will end up with Scaria. Uh, these are, in most cases, a tail larva that will exit the snail and will swim around and either penetrate a final host or in some cases insist as metasicaria or insisted sicaria on vegetation or in a second intermediate host. And then either the sicaria has penetrated the final host or the metasicaria is ingested by the final host to complete the life cycle. So the life cycle is highly variable with the different species of trematodes, but we'll really only talk about one important trematode here today, and this is Fasciola hepatica, the liver fluke. Uh, typically of ruminants. The adult worms, as the name implies, live in the liver of the animals, particularly in the bile ducts themselves. They use a snail intermediate host, uh, and these are particular species of limited snails that favor the interface between land and water. And in fact, these snails prefer to live uh, on black, damp, glistening, muddy surfaces. Uh, after a six-week development stay in the snail, the Sicaria swim out of the snail and insist on vegetation as metasicaria, and then the uh, ruminant eats the metasicaria to complete the life cycle. So I have pictured here a typical life cycle, egg shed in the feces, hatch into a myricidium. Myricidium penetrates the foot of the snail, develops for some six weeks, after which Sicaria are shed by the snail, 
insist on vegetation, and vegetation containing the metasecarial cysts are eaten by cattle. Once in the cow, the uh, metasecaria hatches out in the intestine, uh, penetrates the wall of the intestine, migrates for about a week in the body cavity until it can find a capsule of the liver, penetrates right through the capsular surface of the liver, migrates within the liver for about uh, eight weeks before finding and entering the bile ducts, and then the adult worms live in the bile ducts where they suck blood. Uh, heavy infections may cause anemia, particularly in small ruminants, but most chronic infections result in fibrosis of the liver and calcification of the bile ducts, resulting in condemnation of the liver at slaughter and in production losses in these animals. They simply do not do quite as well uh, as uninfected animals. Diagnosis can be by finding characteristic liver lesions at slaughter or by finding the characteristic operculated eggs on fecal sedimentation. And unlike nematodes, whose eggs are typically recovered by floating the eggs up in a high specific gravity salt solution, trematode eggs do not float well and instead are separated out by sedimenting them from the feces in a soapy water solution. Now these represent the uh, eggs of trematodes. Uh, this is one where you can see the operculum has popped open, allowing a myricidium to swim out. Uh, fairly large eggs in the case of Fasciola hepatica, uh, roughly twice the size of our typical strongyl eggs. The cestodes are the tapeworms. Cestodes uh, are flatworms like trematodes, which means they're hermaphroditic, they have no body cavity, uh, and relatively flattened. However, unlike the trematodes, the cestodes are segmented, and these are very ribbon-like and long-segmented. Another difference from the, difference from the trematodes uh, is that the cestodes have no digestive system whatsoever, no mouth, no intestine, nothing. Instead, they live in the small intestine where the host has already digested nutrients for them, and they simply absorb nutrients from the host's gut contents right through their cuticle. Like trematodes, cestodes are hermaphroditic, but unlike trematodes, which have one set each of male and female organs, Cestodes will have either one or two complete sets of male and female organs in each segment. And some of these uh, larger cestodes can have hundreds, if not thousands, of segments. So they can have many, many complete sets of reproductive organs. Now, of the cestodes, there are two major groups with substantially different life cycles. The cyclophilidia are our most common tapeworms, these are the ones you think of, these are the tapeworms that consist of a long segmented strobola and then a head containing four round suckers on the scolex. These are typically adapted to a terrestrial life cycle uh, and the egg itself uh, contains a fully developed embryo when shed and this embryo known as an alcosphere contains six hooks and finding these six hooks in the egg is a dead giveaway that you're dealing uh, with an egg of a cyclophilidian cestode. The other major group are the pseudophilidia. These are much less common, although there is one very important species here in Florida. Um, they tend to have an aquatic life cycle, and their head, instead of having large round suckers, they tend to have slit-like uh, hole pass devices known as bothria. Uh, and because they are adapted to aquatic life cycle, they shed a fluke-like egg that is undeveloped, when passed in the feces and develops into a ciliated larvae that hatches out with an operculate and popping open, much like we see in flukes. Of the cyclophilidia, far and away the most important to us in veterinary medicine uh, here in Florida is Dipylidium caninum, which is a tapeworm infecting dogs and cats. It uses fleas as the intermediate host. Uh, and this is a relatively innocuous tapeworm. Uh, we see a lot of very heavy infections, and we see little, if any, clinical disease. Far more disease is being caused by the fleas that transmit this tapeworm than the tapeworm itself. Uh, fairly easily treated when diagnosis is made, typically by finding tapeworm segments in the feces of the dog. There are a number of species of the genus Tenia and other related, closely related species in livestock the life, stock, life cycle of these typically involves the livestock as an intermediate host, not a final host. A carnivore is the final host, or in some cases, humans are the final host. 
Uh, as adult worms, the tineids are almost without exception harmless. However, they can cause clinical disease uh, in the intermediate host. And since the human can be the intermediate host of some of these parasites, we do get quite concerned, particularly a species called Echinococcus granulosis. Uh, and you can read more about this uh, in, in your uh, textbooks. Manesia is the most common adult tapeworm inhabiting the intestine of ruminants. Now, I mentioned the tineids. Ruminants were intermediate hosts. Manesias occur in ruminants. They use an oribatted mite, which is a little free-living mite that feeds on detritus out in pastures and gets accidentally eaten when uh, swallowed. Uh, these are quite abundant mites, and these are the intermediate hosts of Manesia. Anaplocephala is, the same or is, is a similar genus to tapeworms, very closely related to Manesia, except this group is adapted to horses. Same sort of life cycle. Uh, whereas Manesia appears to be relatively harmless in uh, ruminants, at least one species of Anaplocephala, Anaplocephala perfoliata, is thought to cause some erosion of the small intestine right near the ileocecal junction uh, and may contribute to colic in horses. There's some association between the occurrence of colic and heavy infections with Anaplocephala perfoliata. So it's a little bit of an exception to our rule that adult tapeworms, uh, at least adult cyclophilidian tapeworms, are harmless. Now the pseudophilidia, the uh, group with the aquatic life cycle, uh, several species, uh, the most important one to us here in Florida is Spironetra mansonoides. This is the second most common tapeworm in cats uh, and dogs here in Florida after Dipylidium caninum. Um, the, war, the eggs are shed into the water where they, after a period of time, hatch out, and the little corosidium, or ciliated larvae, infects a copepod, which is a very abundant aquatic arthropod. Uh, this copepod, after a period of development, is subsequently ingested by a variety of organisms, and spirometra is not particularly cheesy. Frogs may be, uh, for example, even humans, uh, small rodents. Basically, almost any other vertebrate seems to be able to serve as a second intermediate host. And then finally, the second intermediate host is eaten by the final host. So cats or dogs that can catch frogs and other small vertebrates can become infected with this tapeworm. Diagnosis is made by finding the operculated eggs in the feces. And often this thing is confused with a trematode. But the eggs of uh, spirometra tend to be very, very abundant. And the final pseudophilidian is Diphilobothrium latum. Um, this is known as the broadfish tapeworm because the second intermediate host is typically a fish. This is a parasite of carnivores and humans. A like with uh, Spirometra, you have a copepod first intermediate host. So the fish serves as the second intermediate host. And eating undercooked fish uh, results in transmission of this parasite. It's not one that we see in Florida. However, it is a parasite that um, we uh, may see in the northern U.S., particularly around the Great Lakes. This ends my uh, lecture. I uh, hope you've learned something. Clearly, we do not have time to cover all the veterinary parasitology in a, in, in a single hour, but I feel that I've given you an idea of the sorts of things you want to study to best prepare yourself for the board exam. Thank you for having me give you uh, this lecture, and good luck in your exam.